Yeah. Now, similarly, think about the following. Welfare, the welfare state sees technology as a threat. If you watch the way we operate in the opportunity society, we consistently see technology as an opportunity. It's a very powerful cultural test. The next time you read about new technology, do you think it's an interesting way of improving the future, or do you think it's a threat to the present? Now, it's of course both. Which goes, this goes right back to the Chinese word, doesn't it? I mean, every new technology is danger and opportunity. And the question is, which one do you make it? So of course, you know, if, if you are a glass maker who blows glass, and Coca-Cola comes along and invents a system to make bottles automatically, it's an enormous threat. On the other hand, if you're the consumer of bottled Coke, and they were going to charge you $37 per hand-blown bottle, it's a terrific So you've got to constantly be looking in a dynamic way. The welfare state ultimately, because of all this, clings to the second wave, and the opportunity society inherently tries to grow the third wave faster. Now, one of the keys to this, which makes it very complicated to talk about public policy, is that creating third wave jobs is the role of the entrepreneur. <coughs> and we don't know how to teach this, and we don't know how to create public policy around it. But the fact is, jobs are created by entrepreneurial personalities who do not fill out reports very well, do not show up in bureaucracies very well, don't make government employees very comfortable, and can't explain themselves to reporters very articulately. That almost always you can explain the past better than you can explain the future. And almost always politics is organized around propping up the past, not around creating the future. Because by the time you get organized enough to have an interest group, you're already the past. And the people who are inventing the future are too busy inventing to worry about being an interest group. In that framework, however, people need to learn, if you wage class war on employers, you are waging war on employees. It's a very core concept. I mean, if you believe it's an entrepreneurial society and that to get into the third wave and to dominate the world market, you have to have lots of entrepreneurs. But your attitude is, if you're an entrepreneur, you must be bad. Because after all, you're going to get rich. I mean, look at Bill Gates. It's terrible. I mean, he's created 2,200 millionaires in, in Bremerton, and that's even worse. So it's not just him. It's, it's a whole class of people who are doing bad things. So if you want to punish the entrepreneur, you by definition punish the job that would have been held by the non-entrepreneur. You can't have it both ways. You can't say, well, let's just tar, we'll do a rifle shot. Let's just shoot the one who is creative. We won't shoot the people who have jobs. Guess what happens to all the jobs? They all disappear. This is one of the most important psychological decisions the country has to make. Do you want jobs enough to create entrepreneurial behaviors? In which case, entrepreneurs will behave like entrepreneurs. Or do you dislike people who are successful enough You'd rather punish them even if the result is other people don't have jobs. Because you can't, in a free society, break out of that box. It is one of the great formulas, one of the great uh, interesting conundrums of our time. It's also important to remember that entrepreneurs create baby businesses. It's not small businesses. A baby business is a small business with a big potential. A lot of small businesses that start out small stay small and want to be small. People are in a, remember the McDonald brothers. They, would not, they didn't want to become McDonald's. Because it would have been too busy, they'd have been too busy being managers. They wanted three restaurants. And so they said to Ray Kroc, you want to create McDonald's? You create. In fact, they didn't even want to do that until he talked them out. I had to literally talk them into it. Please let me make you rich. <laughs> Huge. Took him over a year if you read his book, uh, Grinding It Out. So you're looking constantly for the baby business, which is going to explode. Microsoft was always a baby business. Federal Express started as a baby business. I mean, Fred Smith knew from the word go, this was going to be a world company. Because it didn't make any sense as a Memphis company. In that framework, there are tremendous virtues of starting small, thinking thoroughly, and combining patience with persistence. I mean, if somebody came to me and said, how can I get to be truly wealthy or truly successful? I would, I would say literally, start small, think things through thoroughly, and combine patience with persistence. That is, patience is not being inactive. Patience is being very active, but being patiently very active. Not allowing the frustration to stop you. Entrepreneurship is a learned skill. And again, I, I recommend I go back to Drucker's Effective Executive. As all of you know, I was mentioned off now. If I wanted to be an entrepreneur, I'd start with the Effective Executive. Because the core lessons of effectiveness are absolutely vital if you're going to be an entrepreneur. You combine this with a visionary sense of wanting to get something done, a very strong ego, 
uh, and a willingness to work very, very hard. Now let me, let's look at one of the great entrepreneurs of our time, a man who uh, you'll, you'll be surprised as you see this, how many things you relate to he's involved in, uh, Norman Brink. I just want you to just listen to this and maybe make notes about what you learn as you listen to him. Whether it's his beloved game of polo or his magical success in business, Norman Brinker simply does not know how to lose. Since he began running the Chili's restaurant chain in 1983, annual sales have soared from $30 million to $500 million. Before that, he turned around Burger King, he ran Bennigan's, and of course, he founded Steak and Ale. Norman's like a, one of these living legends they have in the business. There's very few of them around. One of the things I learned from Norm is, you know, you never stop trying, and uh, you d you're not afraid to take a risk. You try things, if they don't work, uh, you come back and try it again, or you improve it, modify it, and attack again. You walk into one of his restaurants, and you can see everybody's faces just light up, and you realize that he treats people with his equals, he treats people with dignity and respect. He gets the very best out of people by treating them fairly. Who are you going to play first? Him first? Uno. Though horses have always been Brinker's first love, it was ironically the love of a horse that taught him how to be a good businessman when he was just a boy in Roswell, New Mexico. I can recall in the first grade where my friends were interested in bicycles, I was interested in, I was interested in horses. And uh, was bound and determined someday to own a horse. And so I went to work, I think when I was nine, on a, with a paper route in order to make some money to buy a horse. In 1964, after a management stint at Jack in the Box, he left to open his first restaurant, Brink's Coffee Shop in Dallas. I can remember uh, Norman uh, waiting on tables in there. He was the cashier. He was the cook. I knew Mr. Brinker. He uh, has enthusiasm that's just bubbling from the time he it's up in the morning until the time he goes to bed at night. Norman's enthusiasm led him to bigger things. He started a restaurant chain called Steak and Ale. He taught his waiters and waitresses to introduce themselves in a way that would soon be copied nationwide in the restaurant business. Good afternoon. My name is Michael. I'm going to be your waiter today. Hi. How are you doing? Doing fine, thanks. At Steak and Ale, Brinker also created the first salad bar in a restaurant which again would set a national trend. So I said, okay, if I have a salad bar, that means as soon as you take an order, the customer can get up and get to a salad bar, so you won't have to say, well, what's happening? And, and it avoided get in, getting into the bread and butter appetizer business. Steak and Ale was an amazing success story. It grew to 102 restaurants in 10 years and was worth $102 million when he sold it to the Pillsbury Corporation in 1976. As chairman of the Pillsbury Restaurant Group, Brinker oversaw such chains as Bennigan's and Burger King. In the early 80s, Brinker led Burger King in a burger war against McDonald's and eventually tripled the chain's profits. I learned early on that excitement makes a lot of difference in this because I'm not in the food business. I'm in the entertainment business. I'm in the, in the fashion business, if you will, and we happen to serve food. Despite his hectic schedule, Norman finds the time to meet with young people just beginning their career. Norman, what do you tell that 29-year-old uh, who's worried about life right now? What do you tell him or her is at the end of the entrepreneurial rainbow? Well, well I, t I tell them that, they're, that the neat thing about being an entrepreneur, there's no end of the rainbow. It can go on into your 80s. But what I tell them, to, if you want to get there, you need to do a few things. One is to know who you are, what you are, and what you really do enjoy. You can't go say, I'm going to do something because it makes a lot of money. You may do some, if you go do something you are really good at, then the money may come. And then I say, you ought to set a clear-cut set of goals to accomplish what you want and become very, the very best in that line of business and then go do something on your own and also benchmarks along the way so that you know uh, the people i know who have accomplished a great deal it's step by step by step i see these people wandering around who are waiting for that big deal that never happens it's step by step by step so what do y'all think 